We've been in business since 1996, and we're very, very proud about that, helping to build positive images of us, who we are, so that we can see ourselves in a positive light. Because we all, we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words, and when you see yourself in words or in a picture, it, it, it's, it's much stronger than words, and we have to feel positive about who we are. We have to touch a little bit on the COVID situation that's going on during the past two years or so, because it's very, very key with all the artists from around the world, how they're capturing what's happening during the COVID time period. Because when they come back years and years and years from now, and they pull the archives, they're gonna be looking at what was captured with the pictures, just like they went back into the cave to see what was on the wall. So this is a very, very key time in history right now. This this time has not been denoted yet. I don't know what they're gonna call it, but you know we had the Harlem Renaissance era with the Romar Beards and the Jacob Lawrence's Langston Hughes, on and on and on. And then we had the Golden Era. That was really from like 1985 to 2005. And that consists of like your Paul Goodnights. Paul work is here, um, Charles Bibbs of the world, Larry Poncho Brown on and on and on. So this new period is being recognized and being captured with the new artists. Now, when we went into business, what was very, very key for us as we dealt with internationally acclaimed artists, um, Annie Lee was my first mentor. Unfortunately, she passed away f five years ago. Um, and then my second mentor was Paul Goodnight. So she taught me business from the business standpoint because she was a very strong business advocate, won a lot of awards, and also a millionaire. Now, Paul teaches me the business from an artistic standpoint, understanding of how to go down into the belly, try to understand what the artist is thinking about, trying to be a little bit more emotional and empathetic as a person being and dealing with all the artists. So I can tell you that my artist and toughest job is not trying to make money. It's dealing with the people to be honest with you. So um, I just, um, after 36 years, I just retired from a major corporation as a sales and marketing executive. So I put all what's called my heart and soul into this business as we move forward now to go globally, to take market share, to go globally and grow with our artists from the metro Detroit around the country. So when we came to the artists, we also wanted to call it the show Heart and Soul because we wanted them to put their heart and soul into the show pretty much and go deep down into the belly and to develop from, from that area. But what's so important as collectors, as consumers, is that you're educated on the arts, what the artist is thinking about, that we have educational materials on a non-stop basis. So we have one of these for you right here. This is called the Education of Art, okay? And this sheet right here talks pretty much about what an original is, what a stereograph is, what a jacle is, what a limited edition is, on and on and on in the art world with art lingo. And so it's very, very important that we continue to educate you, that we give you the tools um, as we move forward. Now, as a collector, usually when you get into the business of collecting, first of all, you're going to collect art that you like. That's just the bottom line. You're going to collect art that you like. So that's very, very key and important that you understand what you like. And then from there, you start looking at how do I build my portfolio a little bit more from there to strengthen that. So before I go <laughs> further, I would like to take each of the artists and have them introduce themselves, give their background, because their background and the depth of their background is going to give you understanding of how they develop the art, how they go down into what we call belly, to call up, to, to develop belly art. So for our first up is, well, first of all, let me say, because not all the artists on the panel are part of the Heart and Soul show, so we don't have Carol Maruso here, um, unfortunately, because of the holiday weekend. Um, we had Henry Heading, he just had to leave. Singor was part of the team. And um, so was Paul Curtis in this Heart and Soul show that you're seeing right here. And we just brought to the table three months ago, 
right after my retirement, I realized I could not run the ship by myself, but we had a very, very dynamic young artist, and his name is Marcel Stewart. So we're happy to have Marcel on the team, and uh, his job is to digitize our business. When I say digitize our business, the things that he's been able to do in the last two or three months is, um, first of all, he built our first virtual gallery. So our first virtual gallery is up and running. He just got finished building what's called our gift store. In our gift store alone, we've just launched over 135 new items um, to move forward. So this came from my sons. I have two sons, um, 27 and 30 years old, okay? And they said to me, Dad, you really need somebody young to help you to run this business. And I said, well, I got it. I got somebody about 45 now. They said, no, oh, Dad, this is not what I'm talking about. You need somebody about 25 or 30 years old. And my sons, them loved his work. And they did collect some of his originals and everything. And they met him and with his demeanor, his knowledge and everything. They felt that he was the right person to be a family member of Emoja's team to help step in. So without further ado, sing or read. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ian, uh, for having me and have, having me be a part of this show. Uh, my name is Singor Reed. I'm an artist and educator. I, uh, currently, I'm the chair of the Fine Arts Department at Cranbrook Kingswood Upper School. And, um, you know, just I've been uh, teaching by day and painting by night uh, for uh, oh, 21, 22 years now. So, uh, just uh, very honored to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Marcel Stewart, as Ian mentioned. Um, I'm a 30 year old abstract artist. I practice many different mediums uh, from still life, being one of my favorite, all, all the way over from watercolors and collages. Uh, I've received a scholarship from College of Creative Studies. I'm a member of multiple uh, social art social groups throughout the community. I've also shown nationally and internationally. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Daniel Curtis. Um, interestingly enough, I'm the oldest person on this uh, panel. <laughs> but I'm the, supposedly, I'm the, the youngest uh, artist on the panel. My experience has been one, my actual educational experience, I mean, I was into mechanical drawing. Uh, that's early on in life. And then I had children who was probably the best teachers of all who make demands. And so they had me draw each and every character that they could think of, and then some they couldn't. And then I had a wife, or had, I do have a wife. She left. She didn't leave me. She just left because she had something to do with <laughs> But, <laughs> but she, um, she saw some things and she pushed me and then I pushed her back. And so we've both become late blooming. Um, my, my partner calls it early laden and late uh, developed, and as they say in the in the alcohol industry, um, but we are late bottled, I should say. Um, we've had an opportunity to start developing art and drawing and painting and having fun. We like uh, expression and abstract expressionism. Uh, I've done the same and I've done here. Also do some portrait work. I've, I've basically worked in the various mediums. I didn't know there was a bar to working in various mediums, but I guess that's my naivete. I'm glad I'm old but new. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So, as we move forward, I just want to give you a little secret tip for the new collectors when they're going into somewhere or you go to a new gallery and you don't want to be intimidated a little bit or you're looking at abstract art and you don't realize what you're looking at, um, take a look at the title. You know, a ti the title a lot of times, you know, um, <coughs> tells you what the artist is trying to project. And that's why they named that, that particular piece. So for those who are new or just getting started or being in galleries, we don't want you to be nervous. We want you to, 
seem like, hey, I'm part of this world, you know, I, I, I've been collecting a little bit. So with that, um, what the, my first question for the panel is, once someone moves past the stage of where they're just saying, hey, I'm just getting this art because I like this art, and I want to start to collect a little bit and build, and we'll talk about generational wealth a little bit later, but I, I want to build. How do I develop my eye? How do I train my eye to be able to see from the different mediums and things of that nature and understanding how to collect and just the processes to go through? Um, for me, and, and um, <clears throat> being a, a part of this art community here in Detroit, um, you know, we have the luxury of having many, many different venues to actually see art. Um, from our museums, to our art centers, to our galleries, to our organizations, uh, and, and even uh, the level of involvement with our schools and our art teachers. There's so many opportunities for people to see art in Detroit. And that's one of the main things that I think, you know, uh, as a, a budding collector, someone who wants to start a collection of some kind, um, you know, you have so many different outlets and venues to take advantage of. And going to see art is incredibly important um, because, you know, growing up, you know, whatever your level of exposure to the arts may be, um, you know, you may have in your idea in your mind an idea of what you think art is and what you think art should and could be. Um, and it's not until you actually go out and actually go to galleries and see, you know, everything from a very conservative portrait to somebody wild streaking down the street and calling it art, you know, <laughs> naked down the street, you know, and, and calling that art. Um, you know, you really want to be able to see the full breadth of what artists do and what creative people, the kinds of projects creative people are involved in. Um, and that takes time. You know, that may take a year, two years. It may take time before you even buy anything. Um, you know, but getting that exposure is very key in terms of developing your eye and, and you being, you know, going to see art, reflecting on what you saw and then sort of looking inward and, and trying to figure out, like, okay, well, what is it that, out of all the things I've seen over these past several months, you know, what do I want to see in my house every day? What do I want to see in my home? What do I want to see in my bedroom? And that takes time. And so developing that eye involves you just being present um, and, and seeing as much art as possible. And Detroit makes it easy because we have something going on every weekend. <laughs> every week, whether it's something like this, you know, uh, you know, an artist gallery talk, uh, or an opening, or you know, a party in an art space or in a creative space. I think exposing yourself to the arts as much as possible is, is key in getting started. Well. Uh just to piggyback on what Singor said, um, and what really the question that Ian asks, I think, is a, a question that deserves multiple answers. And um, my answer is pretty much, you know, each piece of art deserves a particular amount of craftsmanship when the viewer looks at it. Uh, we we all as viewers look for that that perfect piece, whether we're looking at uh, it being wired or it being. Um, sized correctly or it having the edges painted, whatever that is, whatever that specific uh, precision is that you're looking for, I'm sure the artist has uh, meticulously put that inside of the piece as well. Uh, so I, I definitely pay attention, uh, pay close attention to the craftsmanship when I create my pieces uh, and the intention of hoping that it'll go to a collector that appreciates that same thing. As a collector for over 40 years, if you ask that question to a new collector, first and foremost, what do you like? Does the piece move you? Does the piece, do you like it in terms of the, the color and the, and, the, and, the, and the shape? What does it have meaning? I, I think the tendency, let me do it this way. 
the very first piece of artwork I purchased was something that was affected by advertising. And it, people may remember the Strolls had a series of African mm -hmm. quasi African art. Mm -hmm. And I bought a piece. I remember I bought that and I, I got old enough to have money. And so I bought the piece of art. I look back on it. I don't know where it is because like I said it's been over 40 years ago. The second piece I bought was a piece by uh, Nfume. He's a Canadian artist, well he's Nigerian, he moved to Canada and he, he had pieces that I got. I got two piece, one piece from the, uh, um, from the Pyramid Gallery, I think at the time Purcell Pfeiffer worked there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second piece of his work, I bought it directly from the artist. It was at an art fair. It was down at Greek Town, and they had an art fair. Buy what you like, first and foremost. Read as much as you can so you can become informed to know how to keep it and how to protect it how to keep it from under the heater, or out of the cold, or not in the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then, talk to your children. Now this is a step up. You, you collect that art? Mm -hmm. Talk to your children. Because mm -hmm. the likelihood is great. Is that, that's who it's going to go to. Mm -hmm. Okay? And maybe get permission from your wife or your husband. Because that's always a good thing. A partnership in terms of getting art. That's important. If the two of you can do it, whew, you're unstoppable. I mean, you get into, you get as old as me, and I think I'm old as great nut flakes, and <laughs> you know, and you have the ability to have pieces from years and years ago. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you liked it, and it fit well in your house. And then you start saying, "I'm not talking about my couch is blue, so I need a piece of blue art." You have to. Look, this is a step up. Don't try to match your art to your, to your furniture. Mm -hmm. Get good furniture, and then don't worry about it, but get good art. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys very much. I want to quote a phrase from Forbes magazine that indicated that the art market has outproduced the stock market. I think the average return on the stock market this year, and everyone is still happy about it, is it like in the 10 to 15 percent range. But in the art market, the return has been in like the 20 to 25 percent range. And you might say, well, where are some of those numbers coming from? And those numbers come pretty much from like the auction houses and places like that that's tracking up the business and, and things of that nature. I'm not going to even get into the NFTs, and I don't know if everybody knows even what the NFTs are at this particular point in time. But I'm not going to get into that. But as far as a return on your investment, in the last few years, it's been a higher return on the investment. So you guys have, guys have talked to someone, and you have told them what they should be looking at and basically how they should develop an eye for looking at art from the different mediums, whether it's charcoal, oil, watercolor, on and on and on. But can you tell them why they should collect art? Well, I, well, to, to sort of speak to that question and, and the, the, the word investment that you used, um, you know, there's several investments that are happening when you buy a work of art. You know, number one, you're making an investment in your community. Um, you know, you are, because if you're an artist, you basically are a small business uh, or a large business, uh, you know, but you're a business um, regardless. And so, you know, when you are um, purchasing a, a work of art from an artist, you're investing in that artist's work, you're investing in, in them as a business, you're making an investment in your culture and in your community. Um, you know, and especially if you can develop a relationship with the artist. Um, you know, then, then it becomes a, you know, you, t the two of you are really investing in each other. Um, you know, when I make uh, uh, art, you know, 
and it's 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 so awesome to be in a community of artists. You know, when I'm making a painting, I'm I, there. There's some there's certain people that I know who are going to be there and who are going to see that work. Uh, and so I'm always sort of thinking about them in the back of my head. You know, like, okay, what are they going to say? You know, what what's the critique going to be? You know, from my mom. <laughs> from, from first, first and foremost, <laughs> what's my mother going to say? Uh, you know, but but I'm I'm think I am thinking about my audience. I'm thinking about collectors who are going to see my work, and there's an exchange that is happening there. Um, the other thing is, you know, you are making an investment in yourself. Um, you know, to speak to what Paul said, you know, you are buying something that you like, and you're buying something that you're going to have to see every day, every day that you wake up, you're going to see a piece that is inspiring to you, uh, or, or that helps to wake you up or helps to you know, uh, give you a good mood or educate you in some way. So you're investing in yourself as a person. You know, the economic side of buying a work of art and um, you know, the, art, the idea of the art appreciating in value over time, I think is a wonderful, simple byproduct of you, know, you investing in yourself, your community, um, and, and trying to create a home that is in some way reflective of the richness of your life and your community. Before you pass yes. that on, I just wanted to yeah, say yeah, something yeah. else because he kind of went into my second question. And that second question you answered pretty much is, when you are painting, are you thinking about your collectors? And are you developing the art based on maybe some of your following collectors or future collectors? So if you could answer the question in two parts from when we originally started, the first question was, you know, why should someone collect the art? And then tell us, are you thinking about your collectors or not as a painter? Um, well, to Singor's uh, point again, you know, I think an investment is, is both parties actually have to be involved where you have to have an artist that's actually dedicated to their craft and in some fashion to have some type of diligence behind their own craft for you to see that you would invest, you know, your, your hard-earned money into that piece of work. Um, and you would see that throughout, like how I stated, the craftsmanship, the imagery, um, and, and the hard work that's actually put into the piece. Um, and then from your own standpoint, you see it as an investment to yourself as you purchase a piece of art because it is representative of your lifestyle. It's representative of who you are. As you wake up in the morning, as you tour your hallway, as you go to the bathroom every day, or even if you have guests over, your family members over, they look at that piece of art and they see you. They see the true you. Um, what lies beneath your skin, which you pick up from an art gallery. You know, the, the imagery of you. Um, so, so that's the investment that I see that, you, that you're making in, within yourself. But as far as the monetary uh, investment that you're making, I believe that that's also there uh, in different ways. Um, obviously for more established artists that are maybe international or in auction houses, there is maybe a more immediate investment, but obviously that would cost a little bit more. You have to kind of pay to play in that game. Um, but there are other ways where you could, you know, support the community and you may find a uh, artist that maybe, you know, is just kind of starting off or maybe has just gotten out of school and you, you find nice artwork or even commissioned artwork and that artist rises in value and you may see an, a monetary investment that way. Um, and as far as my personal lifestyle and my art practice goes, when I create art, I create it primarily for myself, but with the uh, thought of the collectors in, in, my, in my head because I would always want to make my next painting better than my last painting. Um, I would never want to go backwards or, or tra travel backwards in time. I, I always try to compete against myself and, and ensure that that next collector has something to kind of look back at and say, okay, he, he's developed, he's grown. I've started uh, professionally painting uh, when I was only uh, 25 years old. So to see that growth over five years, I, I could only imagine where it would be at over 20 years. And to show that investment to the people that, ha that has actually collected in my art, I think is amazing. Yeah, no problem. 
I find it rather incredible that first and foremost I think every artist should be a collector. Every artist has currency in what they do and what they put together and this should not be any way, fa fashion, shape or form that each and every artist doesn't try to use that currency to build an art collection. Okay? Because you have time, hopefully, on your side. And if you don't have time on your side, you have the talent on your side and working towards the talent. One of the things I think every artist does is put them they put themselves up front and on blast. I think it's being used in a vernacular. You expose yourself to a critique. I like that from a perfect stranger, or I don't like it. Uh, why did you do that? Or I'm happy you did that. You know, that fits within what I like in terms of my life. We all have individual and different experiences. And so some of us may have read a book and we start reading about the, the Buffalo Soldiers and start, we start seeing work that embell embellishes that or deals with that and shows us that part of our history and history and our culture. Some of us may very well have seen the migration. So you see a Ty Rawls piece that's sitting here in the gallery that's off the freaking hook. And you, then you start thinking about a Bisa Butler and how she captured that and the different things and the different ways it takes in terms of how people are working with knives or with, with paintbrushes. So if you're, you're developing something, you say, you know something, I, I, I'm going to, because I like it, I'm gonna put this energy in and so I'll do a multiple of self-portraits. And that is about as great a critique as you can self-critique. Because to do a self-portrait, you start looking at something, I didn't know my eye was drooping. Right. It drives you nuts. <laughs> it drives you, I mean, just purity nuts. Or you're doing a piece of someone else, but it's your interpretation. And so you do a mask or you do an abstraction. And you say, okay, why do I like it? If you cook and you want people to enjoy your food, then you make sure that what you, before you serve it, you like it. Okay, <laughs> if you like it, somebody else gonna like it. As, as Michael Horner say, everybody's not the same. If we were, it wouldn't be, we would need somebody. Okay, and so somebody will like a piece. Mm -hmm. It may go on and on in terms of a show, but all of a sudden, folks say, I like that piece. Mm -hmm. Just think of the, the Tanners. Tanner was tied up by his classmates and, and put on the rail on Broad Street in Philadelphia at the PAFA, at the, the Pennsylvania uh, Academy of Fine Arts. That was his contemporaries. But then we now, years later, everybody named Mama would love to have a Tanner, mm -hmm. okay? Why? Because other people have, and now people, they've come to understand the brilliance of that, of that work, mm -hmm. the brilliance of that talent. Or, and I'm gonna go there, a Josh Rayner. Somebody say, oh, he's emerging. That brother not emerging. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a freaking mm -hmm. rocket ship taking off, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> Joshua, this is in the back, <laughs> this brother here can go. Flat out go. Mm -hmm. Or Anzi Norman. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talking about dancing with the big boys. <laughs> Ooh wee. I mean, he and Darren Darby, they're spreading and showing that artists, they're artists, there is something in Detroit and it's cultural and it's it's aesthetic and it's it is skillful. Okay? Aylin Williams and she was mentioned, I think, by uh, Julia Myers in the Harold Neal book. And Julie, and Aylin Williams has said that the only artist in Detroit back in the 40s was Huey Lee Smith. Come on now, we know that's not true. But that's how it happens. We, if we're responsible as artists, and I include myself in that, if I'm responsible, it is important that we record what is going on around us 
It is important in the sense of Jacob Lawrence of recording what has gone before us. It is important in the Wardell uh, uh, Johnson's, I forgot his name right, in terms of Afro Cobra, of what we want futuristically. We got a task, we got time, and we got a responsibility to put the best possible work we can put out. And hopefully we are self-critical enough to be able to put it out and have our culture spread out. I think that is immensely important. Thank you, Paul. So you guys really, really make my life a lot easier because you kind of lead me into my next question. The next area pretty much is, you know, now you understand value, you're starting to collect a little bit, you're starting to see the paintings, but I can tell you some of the art in here that has stunned some people the most okay and I'm gonna have him explain this to you but you got to understand that sometimes when artists are developing they're developing pieces that will become a greater body of work that might be in the museum that's not the particular piece that you're seeing you'll never get that chance maybe to see that museum piece but the work that's being created to get there whether they're from sketch pads and I want to talk about Singor's work right here because you can see this. And then I want you to, guys, give me an analogy with your work, even though we won't see it. But we can see Singor work here. A lot of people come in there like, he created four portraits of himself. Why would he do that? And I have to let him know it's based on the shadows. It's basically he's developed it on a higher end instead of doing it on a sketch pad. And... Um, I feel this is going to be part of a greater body of work where that actual piece is going to be in the museum. So he's trying to figure out his format of where he's going. So Singor, let me know if I'm correct and tell me a little bit more about that, please. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's really important uh, as an artist is that you develop a really strong studio practice. Uh, and by studio practice, I mean you know, we as artists are in the mode of creating all the time, constantly. I have friends who, you know, they'll be snapping their fingers in front of my face, be like, Sangor, Sangor, I just asked you a question. I'd be like, huh? You know, it's like, what's wrong with you? I was like, I just, I created a whole painting while we were sitting here watching this basketball game, you know? <laughs> uh, early, I don't know if you all noticed, uh, Paul had his sketchbook out. He was yeah. drawing. Yeah. A sculpture around the corner here yeah. um, and, and listening to what the presentation and, and, and Whitaker's and everything but at the same time he had something inside of him that needed to come out uh, and he had an impulse to draw and create and so he saw what was closest to him and most sustainable in the moment and sat down and drew it in a sketchbook and so that is all a part of an artist studio practice um, whether or not you have an inspiration, whether or not you have something deep you want to say or not, sometimes as an artist you just want to create. And so the easiest way to do that is by reaching and gravitating toward to what is closest to you. Um, so you know, in my case, I'm, I have been envisioning um, a body of work of, of larger paintings um, where there's like more of a monochromatic color scheme to them and so but I, I haven't I haven't figured out you know that the the um, the totality of those paintings hasn't really formulated in my mind yet but I know I want I want to do it I want to I want to make these paintings um, so it's like well you know let's grab some some uh, some materials and let's just do some self portraits um, Who's a better porch, a, a better subject than yourself? Um, first of all, you you can pose for yourself free of charge. You know, <laughs> you are always available. <laughs> you have to schedule a little time with yourself. You know, <laughs> um, and artists, you know, it, it's a part of an artist studio practice to do self portraits, to record yourself in a moment in time what you look like, how you've aged, if your eyes drooping, you know, uh, and, and kind of get a refresher on what you look like. 
you know, in my mind, I still look like, I still feel like I'm 18. And I feel like I look like I'm 18. But when I look at myself in the mirror, it's like, oh, no, you've aged, sir. <laughs> right. I've got to call myself sir now. Um, and so, and so, you know, me doing these portraits, I challenge myself to work monochromatically, um, you know, using uh, a different color scheme in each one. I tried to position my head in a different way. I tried to play with the distance between myself and the mirror um, that I was using. So there's there's a you know depth uh, uh, transitions happening, and so I'm trying out new ideas on a smaller scale, and then I'll apply what I've learned from doing these four portraits to those larger pieces. Is there any um, shadowing in here or anything you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm playing with light, so I, the, the title of these is uh, Moonstruck 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and I noticed after I started my first one, which was the blue one, uh, that's the one I started first, um, I don't know, it felt like moonlight was hitting my face. And so that kind of influenced the title of the piece. But I, I was trying to play around with a light that was very dramatic, but also had a certain level of uh, luminosity. Um, you know, I, I, because I'm using, um, you know, a mon because I'm working monochromatically, I still want to create a sense of excitement in the paintings, and so I, I was trying to play with the light and shadow uh, in, a, in a way that would make it more interesting. Um, and so, so the, so you know. We, as I move down the line several months from now, um, you know, I will have these portraits. I may have some sketches. I may have some, uh, mm -hmm. last night I was doing some collages, uh, just working with paper and text. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things, all of these different ideas will coalesce down the line. And so and that, so, you know, cultivating a strong studio practice is really important. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, single or so with these right here in, the, in this size, this might be what, 18 by 24 or somewhere in that mm -hmm. area. Okay, so you go to create a museum piece now, a large body of work from this once you understand what direction you're going in. Mm -hmm. to, what size do you think then you would probably be creating more than likely since these smaller pieces were able to help you develop the depth? Mm -hmm. Understand the monochromatic, um, understand the lighting, understanding the textures and the colors and everything mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, well, I'll kind of uh, expand gradually from these. So, you know, the next work that I do in this vein might be uh, 36 by 48 in size. Um, and then the larger paintings I have in mind, I plan on those being more like six feet by eight feet in size and so um, it, and so and part of that studio practice um, and this kind of speaks back to your earlier question um, about do we think about the collectors when we when we make art um, oftentimes in in more recent years especially you know early on in my career I'll say this I always thought about what I wanted my art to be and now I'm thinking a lot more about what it is I want my art to do um, in, in a given space. Um, so, you know, I want to make sure that I kind of hit on several things, you know, moving from smaller to larger. I want to develop my ideas. I also want to create art at every price point, you know, from a business standpoint. I want my art to do sales, <laughs> right? So I want I want to create art that is affordable at different levels, um, and so I'm at, you know I'm create I'm thinking about all of these things, you know, as I'm working in the studio, you know, all of these things, all these different ideas and uh, dynamics are in play uh, while I'm while I'm making art. Hypothetically, yeah. did you guys want to talk on that, or would you want me to move to the well, next question? Sure. Uh, I mean, he hit a lot of key points. I was just going to say, uh, the piece back here is actually a second rendition of one of the pieces that I had created, and it was primarily uh, throughout the same thought process of, you know, having co colors in my art studio, and it's titled Playing in My Palette, and um, it's, it's done with primary colors, you know, red, yellow, 
and blue and looking at those colors and being able to create different tints within and being able to express myself with the colors. Most of my paintings are more vibrant um, and they more so look like an organized chaos. And in this painting, I just wanted to express that movement, still trying to bring out the vibrancy within the paintings while only uh, limiting my color palette to those three colors and adding in uh, the tints of black and white. Thank you. Thank you. In, in keeping with that, I, I think more so it's about process. And when you're engaged in process, um, there's a certain habit you want to develop. Um, the beauty of having a, a self-portrait and having yourself to work with, if people look at it, and you notice that it's a certain look. Self-portraits, uh, uh, um, you, you look throughout history, you see the self-portraits, folks have that look, it's a stare, and it's very critical um, in producing those pieces. Um, if you go into an abstract, and it's still the self-critical, uh, because you're thinking about how you're going to marry those colors together, or if you really crazy, how can I violate the rules but still have it look great? Now you think about Aaron Douglas, he didn't do full figure in many of his pieces. He did silhouettes. And the Emperor, uh, he did the Emperor piece and Emperor Jones. Incredible work. Uh, we look at one, what people, what we like, what we hope uh, others will like, and then we have to have a, uh, really a, a short memory. Because if somebody don't like it, you remember that, you forget about it, that they didn't like it, and you go back to work, okay? Uh, the sketching part is, I mean, it's free. <laughs> it's free. You well, have you, to if you could get a sketchbook, that would be very nice. You could talk about that sketchbook. <laughs> One of the things I tried uh, in collecting, and I, I tried to uh, barter for, is an artist sketchbook. Okay? Very key. Because we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about a work product, a process, and a mental process in terms of how you put those pieces together. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is just invaluable. Mm -hmm. Invaluable. I mean, God, they, they're running around and finding with Van Gogh's sketchbooks and stuff that uh, they're surfacing. What about Basquiat's sketchbook? This kid was not, he, was a, he wasn't just a fly by night. This kid did some incredible work, and the people who got his work that he may have sold them to or gave them to, they're going to surface and folks are going to be astounded. Wow. Thank you, guys. You have answered some very, very key and important questions, and I want to continue to keep the story and the saga going a little longer, and then we can have some questions um, right after this. Um, so we're talked about developing an eye for collecting, collecting what you like, moving beyond that. But then now someone's making an investment. Can we talk about price, value, relationship, pretty much? Can you guys touch on that with art? Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a difference uh, between what something costs, uh, what something is priced at, and what um, some things uh, may be valued at, um, you know, and so I mean, kind of getting back to you know our first point in terms of buying what you like and buying what you what inspires you, um, that has the most value, right? Um, because you're you're dealing with art and imagery um, that will have some sort of value, intrinsic value to you in your life, whether it be capturing a memory a point in time, uh, a certain level of inspiration. Um, now, 
there's a cost associated with that <laughs> with that value um, and so you know as a collector you have to determine for yourself you know what your budget is you know how much you're willing to spend um, you know how much uh, you're willing to invest uh, in a work of art and and again getting back to you uh, being exposed to the arts and really look doing a lot of looking and a lot of seeing of, of art and meeting different artists and seeing different numbers and prices um, you get an idea of, of what uh, market value how that dictates the price of art um, and how that dictates what you may or may not be willing to spend on a work of art um, and you don't you know as a, as a collector uh, you don't always get it right. You know, sometimes I'll, you know, buy a piece of work and I'll be like, man, that was a real, that was a steal. Like, you know, I, 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 I came up on that piece. Other times, you know, I'll, you know, buy a piece of work, spend a little bit more, put it up on the wall. I'll be like, man, they got me. <laughs> you know, but it's it's all good because it's it's a part of the process, you know. And and with every purchase, with with each exposure, you learn a little bit more. Uh, you learn a bit of, a, a little bit more about uh, what's important to you as a collector. What you know, there's abs I don't think there's anything wrong with buying art as an investment purely. Um, it's a part of it's a part of the the marketplace, you know. Um, there are people who will go out and buy work thinking that it's going to double in value, you know, within a year's time or whatever the case may be. Uh, and I don't I don't personally have an issue with that. I think that you know that's just a part of, a part of the game, right? Um, then there are other uh, you know collectors who approach things totally differently, um, and they want the value, they, they want some sort of alignment between value, cost, and price. Um, and I think it just depends on you as an individual um, and, and you cultivating over time your taste and you know how you want to approach collecting art. All right, and, um, I'll I'm going to come from a, a little bit of a different angle. I uh, graduated in uh, 2009, so a lot of my uh, friends and uh, people that I hang around aren't really too much interested in art. Um, so it's kind of difficult to, you know, bring them in, reel them into art collecting and things of that nature. Um, but while doing that, you know, I've learned that the easiest way to do so is to not make it seem so intimidating by um, you know having a place where where there aren't too many of their peers inside of or the prices are maybe out of their range uh, for something that they may not be so educated about um, so what I've seen myself doing is educating my peers for one and then for two you know offering different products at, at different price points uh, to gain their interest in the visual aspect of art it doesn't necessarily have to be an uh, uh, twenty thousand dollar original right now. It can be, you know, maybe something small for fifty dollars that has a piece of art on it to show that hey, I, I like what art looks like, and I know that this is art from an artist. Um, and then once they start to gradually get on that train and it gets to moving, they get a little bit momentum, then they can start to realize what level that they want to be at as a collector. best things in life is free. Right? Mm -hmm. No, nah, ain't you paying something for it. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna pay something for it. Nope. Uh, Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. We started a raffle. People can pay the money, pay 50 cent, pay a dollar, etc. Somebody comes in, okay? They bring an incredible piece of art in. Right? Yep. And folks say, ooh, 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 it's I'm gonna fine. buy it, I'm gonna buy the tickets, mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. And people Somebody wins. Someone who had never collected a piece of art in their life, be they a millennial, be they 19, be they 15, be they 37, be they 78, whatever, bam, they've got a piece of art. And now they're starting. Okay, oh, I got one piece. I got to get another. 
all right? Mm -hmm. Then they come over and they say, mm, I've developed a relationship with a gallerist like a, a, a Ian Grant, and he's going to, you know, he's going to steer me. He's going right. to educate me and help me understand mm -hmm. and understand that the most, the better you're informed, the more you're going to buy because you're doing it from a standpoint of knowledge and self-confidence. And you say, we know what we like, what are we looking for now? And now you've educated yourself and you start looking through books and you say, ooh, this artist is nice. Ooh, mm -hmm. ooh, you know, I mean, I went for years. Finally, after years, I got, me and my wife, we got a Huey Lee Smith, okay? Mm -hmm. We got an opportunity, bam, we got it. Um, went for years wanting a Howard Dean of Pendale. Didn't get it yet. Yeah. It's gonna happen. Oh, right. God willing, in the creek don't ride. All right. <laughs> All right. But you should develop a relationship with a person who has knowledge to help educate you. Mm -hmm. Some people had the advantage of having a Henry Harper who's giving with his time and with his knowledge. Ian is giving with his time and his knowledge. Ian's running a business, but still he's still right. he's still giving with his time and his knowledge. And he's gonna give you a, a chance to buy it, you know, in installments. Right. Hell, if you can get a piece of art, I mean I started out like that mm -hmm. with George. George gave me a starter kit. Now my starter kit was a uh, Emma Amos, a Romare Beard. And, oh wow! Okay, stuff, stuff like that. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Nobody told me I was supposed to not get them. <laughs> so I, I said, okay, I like it. Come on. All right. Or Elizabeth Catlett. And then the beauty of Elizabeth Catlett comes by the house, and she said, she said, oh, she asked about our son, and she asked about she. Oh wow! I remember that trip to. Oh that's, oh, that's nice. You guys have that. Yeah, we do. Or you, you, you develop a relationship with an artist and you catch them early. Okay, yeah, they, you know, they, they haven't shown a lot. The gallery haven't sold a lot, haven't been in museums, et cetera, and their experience hasn't been that great. But they're, you can see it because you've got the advantage that people have guided you and got you to a point where it's, ooh, this is a person you can, you should see and you should get. And next thing you know, you've got yourself a collection. You know, I got 10 pieces now. Oh, I got 20 pieces now. Oh, wow, I got 50 pieces now. I got family coming over and they want me to send my stuff to their house. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. And you like what you like. And, you know, if you're doing it for the money, I'll give you an example. The same Elizabeth Catlett that we got back in 1980s, when Kamal was a arm, he was a he was a armchair baby. 1984. That thing, ooh we <laughs> we got that for less than a thousand dollars, and ooh we, uh, yeah. You see, the one, I'll tell you the one I did. I'll tell you about the one that got away. Had an opportunity to get an Andy Warhol self-portrait and Muhammad Ali, okay? At the gallery where my office was in the Whitney. They ran $5,000 a piece. The Andy Warhol sold, what, a year ago, two years ago for, what was it, 685000 now let's ask the question. Would you pay five thousand dollars to later on get six hundred and eighty thousand dollars? Yeah. No question. No doubt about it. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, before I open the floor up to some questions or some things, just some people who would like to ask the artists, I just like to give a little different twist here. We're constantly trying to move the bar. We're, we're trying to move the continuum. We're trying to move you up the continuum. And I just want to tell a quick story here. Um, we talked about Marcus Glenn, an Academy Award winning artist. He's not an Amoja family member. He would be considered an Amoja team member because he is part of Park West Gallery. So basically, he's global. 
that he sells around the world. And so when we sit and talk, him, myself, and Marcel, we just had this conversation. And he was just saying, you know, Ian, when we take a look at the African-American community, okay, where his name is not strongly as known as it is internationally across the world, he said, you know, it's very, very interesting because African Americans are pretty much still at the stage of buying images. But the Caucasians are at the stage of buying a name. So when they know a Marcus Glenn, art is going to be there that night. They're not so much into what Marcus Glenn I'm going to get. It would be nice if they could get the piece they want. But they're there to get a Marcus Glenn. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. They understand like he's saying. They need an Andy Warhol. It don't make a difference what Andy Warhol that is or Elizabeth Catholic in your collection. You need an Elizabeth Catholic. You need an Andy Warhol. Then you're going to be on those 685 to a million, two million dollar level when those times come. So what I'm trying to say is we need to start looking at the business dual from a dual perspective when you're investing. Because what we like to do at Emotion is to try to just bring different twists to the table. Like I said, we don't want you just to create a bigger box. We want you to create a totally new box. And so that's what we try to teach. So with that, do we have any questions at all that anyone would like to ask the artist? <laughs> I know you guys think I'm a talkaholic, but I would like to say that uh, I like to I like to see artists um, doing creative things, coming outside of their box, taking collectors into consideration, just taking every and anything into consideration, recording the past, the present, the future. Uh, but I also like to see the artists showing their feelings. You know, like when you look at like these paintings and those paintings, and even this one here. I've been staring at the colors, and I can I feel something in it. So I, I think you should just be applauded and continue to do that and service everyone because there's always a match out there. You know, just like I found Mr. Whitaker, we'll find a good piece of art, right? <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I want to tell a story on an artist here, and um, she's also a collector, but I know when she comes into the gallery and she looks at a certain painting and she starts crying, I know that piece has really, really moved her, mm. and that is Deborah. That's so poor. She's cried in here for a few Aww. times mm -hmm. on different art pieces, and uh, those go into her collection. So I know that's when it, they really, really uh, move her. So are there any other questions at, at all? If not, we'll talk. I have one more question so we can wrap things up for you guys. Get a chance to look around. We do have, you know, different type of um, payment type plan programs and, and different things like that to move you into the business at a slower pace of collecting and being eclectic with your collection and the whole bit. And so that last question pretty much is pretty much let's talk about building generational wealth. You just don't build generational wealth. They have to make sure that they're documenting things correctly, that you're dealing with the right individuals that can help you to appraise your work. You want to make sure that, um, <clears throat> that you're getting the work insured properly. So therefore, if something happens to it, and when I look at insurance sometimes, it's not necessarily what the artwork is going to be worth, but maybe if you can't afford that level, it's at least what you paid for it or in between, you know. So, therefore, you can keep the prices somewhat under control. 
So let's talk about and finish this thing with generational wealth, guys, which is important for us to pass it on to the next generation. That's what this is all about. It's no longer about us. I think Marcel might be one of the youngest ones in here yeah, at about 30, but Singor, it's over for you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about generational wealth. Um, Oh, I, well, from my point of view, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a house that was filled with art, um, filled with culture, books, um, you know, history, history. You know, I, I grew up having a very clear understanding of my identity, who I was, where I came from. Um, and so, you know, I think my parents did a great job of, of understanding general wealth, first of all, from that point of view that when they put art in their home, when they put imagery in their home, uh, getting back to you know what you said, your mission and starting with Moja Fine Arts and you wanting to create positive black imagery to go in, into people's homes, um, you know, that was so invaluable for me growing up. Um, and my parents, I think, understood that they were passing down, first of all, a, a value in our culture, first and foremost. Um, and then, then in addition to that, yes, uh, the things that you see, son, up on this wall have value. <laughs> and one day it will be yours. And one day, you know, yes, you have to insure it. You have to take care of it. Um, you know, these are, you know, I know my mother has shown me our records of, you know, when she, you know, what uh, piece of work she bought, you know, for how much, on, on this given date, and, you know, oftentimes there's a story that'll go behind that. Um, and so, you know, me absorbing all of that, now I have to pass, we have to pass it down mm -hmm. to the next generation, uh, to my nephew, um, and make sure that he understands the value uh, of our culture. Um, and that, you know, that, that serves as the foundation, you know, um, and then around that, you know, they will learn and you will teach them, you know, about business, the business of art, uh, the economics of art. Um, and as you learn, I mean, we're learning and we should be learning new things every day, you know, as collectors. And every time we learn something uh, and we absorb some new information, that is something that we should also be passing down to that next generation, too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I just have one younger daughter, so, you know, just instilling art through her or yeah through her by putting up art throughout my house mm -hmm. is uh pretty much the justice that she that she gets every day uh she asks about my uh, paintings and then she also asks about some of the art that i collect and uh put up in our home just because of how vibrant it is and uh just like singor stated me and my wife will co uh, collect based on occasion so uh, my first time showing internationally we collected a piece for her and that piece is in my wife's um, office for that particular reason. So when my daughter sees it, she, she'll know exactly when we collected the piece and, and how we collected the piece. Um, and then uh, same thing with when I uh, first shown um, nationally in a different state, we have a piece that I was able to trade with an artist on. And uh, that piece is also hung up for that particular reason so we can have a narrative to tell my daughter. And then beyond that, as we started to collect, um, you know, a little bit more higher end artists, uh, it was simply just to be able to tell my daughter how, you know, value does increase in art, not only from my art as an artist that she can actually see painting every day. She may just think, okay, hey, he's down there working in the studio or hey, he's doing whatever, he's just painting. She's able to see a different medium from a different artist that will probably be long and gone by the time she's old enough to actually realize what it is. Let's, let's make this easy. Each piece of work should be signed. It should be signed so that someone can be able to read it Amen. and know who the heck you are. Amen. That's first. Second, a certificate of authenticity should accompany the piece of art. Let's take it another step. There should be a provenance list that is accompanies that piece of art and where they buy this piece of art at Emoji. He didn't know I was going to ask him for this. I need a sticker. I need a sticker with Emoji Gallery on it. Mm -hmm. 
so that it goes on the back of the piece of art that I not only purchased from Emoja, but you know, when somebody comes in here and buy a piece of my art, I want Emoja gallery on it. Right. Okay? And so then when it starts making its trip through time, folks can relate back, mm -hmm. records will be there. Come on, we, we got we big kids now, we got digital, we got cameras, we got everything. We got we have receipts. And so why not? In order to show what value it is, who's come into contact with, those are the things that people look at. Mm -hmm. They start talking about problems. How many exhibitions it's been in. Those are the things that go on the back of that work. So, but you as collectors, you should get that information. You should have a, 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 a spot, a place where you put your documentation. Or you have it. Cloud, I guess it'll, I guess it'll be here. So <laughs> download that to the cloud, so you can reach out and touch it, and not have to run around looking for it. Mm -hmm. All right. So think about those aspects in terms of generational wealth. When they get to the point where you can show where it's been. All right. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, I'd love to see the stuff that came out of Shirley Woodson Reed's gallery. Let's go over. Ooh wee. I love it. Okay? Think about it. I mean, and you know, you had you had Kelly Williams out there, you had George Rogers out there. What I mean, I mm -hmm. I stay in contact with his son because the deal is finding, God, you got all these records, dude. Mm -hmm. Don't throw the envelopes away. I got some old magazines and some old stuff from Charles McGee mm -hmm. that I got through Michael Horner. Okay. It's all important because we're talking about history. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to go back, but it's right. our, our story. It's our story. And we should be able to tell it, and we should be able to document it, and we should be able to pass it on. And the parts about the money part, hey, it's fun. It's important, but it ain't for us. It's for our kids. Mm -hmm. I got grandkids, great grandkids, uh -oh. okay? Uh -oh. And my position is, this is for you, uh -oh. all right? Got it all. Well, if we don't have any further questions. Um... <clears throat> we made one final comment, and I'm, I'm done. Okay. I'm gonna push back on Marcus Glenn a little bit. In our community, here in the city of Detroit, I know the Copelands, and I okay, the Copelands were related to Aaron Douglas. Mm -hmm. People around them, there's some people, not everybody, a lot of the doctors and some of the lawyers, etc. They bought names. They said, "Oh, you know, Huey Lee Smith, Leroy Foster, get this, okay." And so we reached out and we sh we ran after it again. And then you and you know, and then we we find out about a Shirley Woodson Reed, and now we get Shirley Woodson Reed's work. I don't care what it is, get it. There you go. Okay, we got living history right here, mm -hmm. and somewhere in here we be, we were smart enough. We didn't do it with with Mr. Scarborough. We didn't do that. We better we better tape him, and we better tape our own. Okay. <laughs> well. I just want to tell our panel, excuse me, I just want to tell our panel, thank you very, very much today. I hope everyone that's here, our goal is just to make sure you at least learn one new thing from when you sit into these educational sessions to be able to put the whole big picture and the whole big puzzle together. And you know, like they said, collecting and with us being in the business for so long, I do unfortunately have certain people that bring their family art back to us because we sticker everything and they have invoices and the whole bit and they get it, they don't know what it is, they're young, they don't want it, and they just want the funds. But they could come back with the invoice and say, hey, my aunt got this here or my mom got this here or whatever. So I figured I would bring it back to you first and we're more than happy to do that. <laughs> so um, with that, continue to build generational wealth Detroit is a mecca when it comes to the art world. I'm going to give you an example on that because it's 
it's over 30 art galleries right in this market. Now, some might be frame shops, some are fine arts gallery, but my son lives in Miami, and we're leaving for Art Basel next Thursday. And believe it or not, within that Miami area and as much cash flow that's down there, we really only have two African-American galleries right in that Miami art market. So you can just see how active Detroit is. I know it was at least three minimum events of close people that I know today, minimum three events. So Detroit is a mecca. We're building fast. And our job is to take this to the rest of the world with the music at the same time. And we're globalizing everything. OK? Right. So with that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stay around. Have some fun. Have some good conversation. And um, thank you for coming. How many people are here? Just Job capturing. Nice